Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Can you all hear me okay in the back? Everybody can hear, I hope. Welcome, welcome this morning to this celebration and memorial for Charlie and Joe Jacobson. I'm Reverend Ann Richter, the rector here at St. Ambrose, and uh, we welcome everyone. Our service is actually gonna begin this morning with military honors for Charlie. Because if you didn't know, uh, Charlie was uh, in the Army from 1953 to 1955, and then he was eight years after that in the Army Reserve. This was all during the Korean War. And he got two, two uh, medals. He got the National Defense Service Medal and the Good Conduct Medal, which is not a surprise. <laughs> so at this time, we'll proceed with final military funeral honors. It's requested that if able, you please stand covering your heart with your right hand. If you're a veteran or currently serving in the United States military, it's appropriate to render a hand salute, and at the completed of taps, we invite you to be seated.
Our opening hymn today is Morning Has Broken. It is in our hymnal, which is that blue book next to you in the pews. If you would like to sing along, you can get it. The number is number eight. And again, if all who are able, please rise in body or spirit. <coughs> here today to remember before God our sister Joe and our brother Charlie, to give thanks for their lives, to commend them to God our merciful Redeemer, and to comfort one another in our grief. May God be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God of grace and glory, we remember Joe and Charlie before you and thank you for giving them to us to know and to love as companions in our pilgrimage on earth. In your compassion, console those who mourn. Give us faith to see that death has been swallowed up in the victory of Christ, so that we may live in confidence and hope until by your call we are gathered into the company of all your saints. By the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich foods, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. He will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the covering that spread over all nations, he will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and 
the disgrace of his peoples he will make a, take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, See, this is our God, and we have waited for him, so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Hear what the Spirit is saying of to God's people. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. The psalm for today is number 121. I think it's on the board. We will read it responsively by whole verse. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From here is my help. Where is my help to come? My, my help, help comes, comes from, from the Lord, Lord the, the maker, maker of heaven and, and earth. He will not let your foot be moved, and he who watches over you will not fall asleep. Behold, he who keeps watch over Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord himself watches over you. The Lord is your shade and your right hand. So, so that the sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you for all, from all evil. It is he who shall keep you safe. The Lord shall watch over your going out and your coming in from this time forth forevermore. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. The second reading is from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. If I speak in the tongues of humans and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable. It keeps no record of wrongs. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now, we see only a reflection, as in a mirror. But then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part. Then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now, faith, hope, and love remain. These three, and the greatest of these, is love. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. It's 
Christ. Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The Holy Gospel of our Redeemer. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated, and I invite now uh, the family members who would like to speak can come forward and uh, take a turn here at the microphone. Hello, Clark, Joe's first child. <laughs> Not the wisest. Now, we sent me up here because I'm the least emotional <laughs> of the four of us. So we thought I'd be most able to get through this, and I, I think I'll be able. Not the wisest, not even close to being the smartest, and not the most involved in the last seven years of heroic caregiving. That's my sister, Diana. But the, but the least emotional. 
Come on. Okay. Um, out of the four of us kids, um, I am the one who went to get some words, uh, but I know that each of us has a whole big world of mem memories and legacy, and of course it goes beyond, way beyond words. Now going past us kids and on to the rest of you here, what is a word that anyone might say about St. Joe? Maybe something that would conjure up an image that fits. I stick on vivacious. How do you describe a glowing ball of friendliness and music with a pool of light around her? Um, you know, Joe is special, Mama was special, and I observe it, I think, you know, how can you be so special like that? You just have to think that everyone else is special and treat them that way. Be truly interested in everyone you meet. I'm pretty sure that my mama was loved or at least appreciated by everyone she ever met. And it's always made me proud. <laughs> to observe that. Growing up, I was proud to bring friends and girlfriends home to show my mama off to them, and to show them there's a little more to me than just the clueless young guy you see in front of you. <laughs> there's four of us, and then Charlie's three kids also, and we could all bring friends home anytime, get treated to hospitality and fun, always with a chance of music. And so any of you, all of you know that she lived for others, including you friends, not just her family. But she was a great friend to us kids, as she was to you, but also heroic in taking care of us, including the reality of parts that are not so fun. <laughs> um, she loved her Charlie. She loved her whole family of relatives. You know, we kind of come from Iowa. There's a family that comes from there. There's some of them here today. Um, but beyond just that, she still had enough left, love left over to always care about everyone else she ever met, as I said, to try to elevate others and then still have enough left to love this world and the beauty in it. <coughs> I slashed out quite a bit of stuff out of here. <laughs> I could give you examples, but I'm gonna keep going. St. Joe shared the gift of music with some thousands of kids as a music teacher, don't know how many, with more other people than anybody really knows in 60 years in and around Boulder, forming singing groups, accompanying choirs, playing piano for institutions, and playing piano for enjoyment, and spare change in restaurant lounges. <laughs> and underneath all of that work with music, she would play the piano <laughs> at the drop of a hat, and she would drop the hat. <laughs> um, <laughs> I would put down money that she could get you singing, even if you say, I never sing. <laughs> she was not political, but always supportive of full equal rights for everyone. That's through the 1960s and then all through life. She was not real religious. This is a beautiful church you have. Um, but she really just lived as a model of caring about other people with compassion. I have thought that those WWJD bracelets can all get one. <laughs> Do you know what I'm talking about? Like a lot of things I'm going to say, um, I'm going to keep this pretty short. Um, and you can find us at the reception if you want. We have anecdotes. There's humor. If you want to do any fact checking, there's, there's meaning in some of this underneath that you know I can't really share all today. Um, I want to say that. Um, Driving over here, Marty played a Willie Nelson song, and hearing that song, driving over here, I thought, I'll just forget about this, and just we should just play that song. Um, <laughs> it's uh, I'm not coming to my, er, I'm not coming to your funeral. What is? It? Um, <laughs> Uh oh, so now I have to look. It's, uh, I don't go to funerals and I won't be at mine. I don't, 
I don't go to funerals and I won't be at mine. I'll be in your memory making music and, you know, leaving my legacy in my music in your memory and singing with my friends on and on like that. So I thought that's all anyone would need to say or know about St. Joe. Had a section on humor and some anecdotes. See us at the reception. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, if uh, uh, Clark's speech was free form and improvisational, as befitted his mother, mine was thoroughly and meticulously written out <laughs> in honor of my father. Thank you all for being here today. I'm Eric, the eldest son of Charlie, who was himself an eldest son, and I'd like to say a few words about him. It's a little easier not to cry, Clark, if you write everything out in advance. I'm just going to tell you right now, but I'm, I'm still not going to pull it off. <laughs> Charlie was born in Wyoming in the opening months of the Depression to parents who were among the last homesteaders and the lessons of that time imprinted on him very strongly. Charlie's father worked as a sheep shearer, well-paid seasonal work that left him looking for odd jobs the rest of the year, and the precariousness of that situation was something my dad seemed determined to avoid. And avoid it he did, holding a single job his whole career, arising at the same hour every day of his life, he was a man of order and work but he had a tremendous love for that work. He loved school and he excelled in learning. The first in his line to be college educated, he got multiple degrees in physics. He was lucky enough to work with the very first computers while in the army. And he later got a job as engineer at Rocky Flats, designing robots to handle plutonium. Even after retiring, he continued to work doing testing for a pharmaceutical instrument company. Charlie met my mother, Jan, while doing graduate work at the University of Wyoming. And they were married in 1960 and had three children, myself, Calla, and Helen. After three years of postgraduate work in Oklahoma, they moved to the Boulder area where Charlie spent the rest of his life. Growing up in the Depression, the oldest of nine children, some of whom are here today, Charlie was exceedingly careful with money. There is a story that he once used a pair of pliers to cut a penny in half to settle a debt with one of his brothers, <laughs> which amused me and that was doubtless intended as a joke, but it nevertheless shows how he could come off as stingy or cheap. There was a grain of truth there. But to take that attitude is to overlook my father's endless generosity with his time and expertise. As a physicist and engineer, he was incredibly knowledgeable about how all kinds of things worked. He would make sets of blocks for his grandchildren, change the oil of the car for friends, or talk relatives through troubleshooting a broken appliance over the phone. I never knew him to refuse to help with any technical problem or complain about the time or energy it took. That being said, after spending perhaps six hours diagnosing and repairing something, he would insist you pay him the full dollar and 79 cents for the part required. <laughs> and don't suggest just giving him two dollars and calling it even. You will get your 21 cents back. <laughs> after he retired, my father's generosity extended to the wider world. He volunteered at Habitat for Humanity, putting in more than 3,800 hours over the course of 22 years. He also spent six years as a volunteer for Boulder Community Hospital, installing lifelines for the elderly. As frugal as he was, there were things my dad considered worth the money. He had an extensive classical record collection and a quality high fidelity system at a time when such things were not cheap. He always owned high quality cameras and took over 4,000 slides in the 60s and 70s. 
and introducing his family to the outdoors was important enough to him that he bought us all cross-country skiing and backpacking equipment. He was also very adventurous when it was just the two of us. On one trip up Mount Audubon, he didn't feel like taking the trail back. And so we decided we would descend down 2,000 feet of rockfall back to a lake near the trailhead, which meant went remarkably well right up until the hail started falling. <laughs> on another occasion, we went up Bear Creek above Boulder, and failing to realize that the trail was up on the side of the drainage, we painstakingly picked our way through the boulders and the briars, showing up many hours late at the pickup point where my mother was not so patiently waiting. Surely one of the only times he was late in his life. <laughs> My father was a man of his word. I cannot even imagine him telling a lie, being deceitful, or breaking a promise. But if you asked him a question, you'd best not expect a sugar-coated answer. And if you had an idea, you could count on my dad to point out the flaws in it. When Charlie met Joe in 1975 after his divorce from my mother, he found someone as direct and no-nonsense as himself. Thankfully, Joe was also a woman of great warmth, who was very social, and over the years she helped him see where his priorities needed realigning, and was unflinching in pointing them out. <laughs> you have an antidote. Do you want to jump in here? <laughs> I've got a couple. Charlie was almost incapable of small talk, so when he had a lunch planned with his daughter, Joe suggested questions he could ask her about her life. <laughs> which he carefully recorded on one of the three by five cards he kept in his pocket. It is proof of my father's complete lack of guile that he then showed the card to my sister, which it has to be said did not impress her, but it was nevertheless a step in the right direction. And when Joe's son crashed the car and called home about it, and Charlie asked about damage to the car before asking about possible damage to the person of her son, <laughs> Joe let him know that was not OK. <laughs> not the proper order of things. Over the decades, she nursed his awareness of the importance of kindness and humanity, latent qualities easily missed beneath his uncompromising exterior. I have dad's elder hostel passport. And he and Joe attended 63 of these in total starting in 1993. Dad kept careful notes on every one. Together, the two of them saw hundreds of presentations, historic attractions, plays, musicals, and operas, especially operas, which they both loved. The last entry is dated fall of 2015. A new chapter of my dad's life started the following summer when Jo had a stroke, losing much of her memory and most of her speech. From that point onward, dad didn't have Jo to do the job of relating to his children for him. There were no more crib notes, no more easy stream of interested and interesting discourse. With the brilliant son of Jo's verbal acuity fallen below the horizon, we could see the quiet stars of my dad's human warmth. In these last years, my sisters and I experienced a newfound closeness with our father. During this time, my dad took on a new assignment, driving to visit Joe in memory care like clockwork, week in and week out. After seven years, Joe entered hospice care, and on July 22nd, Charlie drove to see her one last time. Seeing that she no longer responded to his presence, he picked up a pamphlet left by a hospice worker entitled, Gone from My Sight, The Dying Experience. He read it carefully all the way through. A short time later, it seems he realized he could retire from this last job, and he took his final voluntary breath. My father, man of work that he was, never stopped working on himself. And he continued to become a better human being until the very end of his life. 
and I will forever look up to him for that. Rest in peace, Tim. There will be a chance at the reception for more stories and remembrances. I wasn't too surprised when I learned that The Rose was one of Joe's favorite songs to play and lead during church services. Now, it wasn't written as a church song, but it is all about spreading love. And God, after all, is love. There's also no better Christian virtue to describe Charlie and Joe Jacobson than love kind of love that Paul writes about in that famous passage from 1 Corinthians that we heard today. Joe and Charlie were both filled with the divine love described in Paul's letter. Love that is patient, kind, humble, generous, faithful, joyful, and enduring. And the memories that the children just shared with us, we could feel that kind of love. We saw Charlie's sacrificial love of country honored today as well. Here at St. Ambrose, I've heard story after story about the love and the joy that Joe brought to everyone in this parish over the years. I've heard how her magical music and her laughter filled people's hearts and souls. I've heard how her loving hospitality made all feel welcome. Such outpouring love is never forgotten. I've also heard story after story about how Charlie built this church with his own hands over 50 years ago, and how he continued to fix anything that needed fixing here and to serve on countless committees. I've also heard how he faithfully supported this community through thick and thin. While others could have given up on this little church, Charlie and Joe stayed and loved faithfully and did whatever they could. A few months ago, I sat with Charlie at a parish retreat. He had driven himself over there and had spent a whole long Saturday carefully listening to our plans for the future. At the end, as I thanked him for coming, he tried to apologize with a rueful smile. I'm sorry that I'm not able to do more these days, he said, that I can't help get things done for St. Ambrose. Up until the end, Charlie wanted to serve. Such self-giving love is never forgotten. Now, I first got to know Charlie and Joe the same way that I got to know everyone at St. Ambrose in 2020, as faces in those little boxes on my Zoom screen. But their image will always remain imprinted in my mind. The two of them sitting close together like newlyweds, holding hands, Joe smiling from ear to ear, eyes twinkling, and Charlie listening intently, taking his turn reading scripture, his voice humming with integrity. Watching the two of them on that Zoom screen, it was like there was a heart-shaped bubble of love around their little square, holding them together 
giving them strength. Despite illness, age, and global pandemic, they clearly cherished their time together and their time with us in this place. Still together now, and still with us all in love, Charlie and Joe can continue to grow together in love, in God's love that never ends. Just as they lived that love here on earth, I believe that they are now enjoying the beauty of that love in its fullness in God, whatever that may look like on the other side of the mirror. I pray that Charlie and Joe's loving spirit will remain with us here at St. Ambrose, too, and in the lives of their children and grandchildren. After all, as the author of The Rose wrote, love, it is a flower, and you, it's only seed. I invite you to rise in body or spirit and in the assurance of eternal life given us at baptism, let us proclaim the faith and say together, we believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He He suffered suffered under under Pontius Pilate, Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. God, excuse me, God, your will for us is abundant life. Receive Joe and Charlie now into the fullness of life in your presence. Hear our prayer. You know the thoughts of our hearts and our search for faith. Shed the brightness of your light on Joe and Charlie, who also sought understanding. Hear our prayer. You are greater than all our ideas and images of you. Welcome Joe and Charlie into the mystery of your being. Hear our prayer. We know you as perfect mercy and love. Welcome Joe and Charlie in the grace of that love and mercy. Hear our prayer. We praise you as the giver of life. Gather all who mourn in the hope of renewed life. Hear our prayer. The church commends all who die to the care of Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. And so we commend Joe and Charlie to you, giving thanks for their lives. Hear our prayer. May the Holy One, to whom all the desires of our hearts are known before we ask, hear our prayers for Joe and Charlie, and for all who mourn, and grant us newness of life and peace. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be always with you. you. You all may greet each other. days, but everybody is welcome.
Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right, and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Through Jesus Christ, the pure brightness of the ever-living one, whose glory enfolds us in this world and the next, and who leads us into that place where every tear is wiped away, and we shall see you face to face. Therefore, we praise you joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, 
God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious God, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and maker of all. Jesus stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Savior, Jesus Christ, took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, Almighty God, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling Christ's death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in Christ. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through Jesus Christ, our Savior, by Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. The gifts of God for the people of God.
Let us pray together. Loving God, we thank you that in your great love, you have fed us with the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ, giving us a foretaste of your heavenly banquet. We pray that this sacrament may be for us a comfort in affliction and a sign of our inheritance in that place where there is no death, neither sorrow nor crying, but the joy of true homecoming. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Give rest, O Christ, to your servants with your saints, where sorrow and pain are no more, neither sighing but life everlasting. You only are immortal, the creator and maker of all, and we are mortal formed of the earth, and to earth shall we return. For so you ordained when you created us, saying, You are dust, and to dust you shall return. All of us go down to the dust. Yet even at the grave we make our song, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Give rest, O Christ, to your servants with your saints, where sorrow and pain are no more, neither sighing but life everlasting. Merciful Savior, we commend Joe and Charlie to you. Receive them as sheep of your own fold, lambs of your own flock, sinners of your own redeeming. Accept them into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of your saints. Amen. Amen. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you always. Amen. I invite you all to join in singing Amazing Grace. If you'd like the words, it's in that hymnal, number 671. 671. Amen. Um. 